talking about exceptional exceptions. Now, exceptional exceptions is basically the title of my dissertation. And to start with, uh, when I picked the title of my dissertation as exceptional exceptions, I was told by some faculty that this is not a good title for a dissertation. Who can tell me why? What is it? Exceptional exceptions. It's not very descriptive, right? It, we know that it talks about exceptions, but what else? Right? The problem was that some faculty, I know some of you heard that. The problem was that, according to that faculty, the name is too cute for academics. You know, like, uh, in academia, we like to have very long descriptive title, which is like a paragraph. The title will be a paragraph. By the time you're done with reading the title, your time for presentation is up. And you have to go back and sit back. Like, as you see like later on with the other papers that we will discuss today. And I will try to, I would like the paper to be, that today's uh, presentation to be as uh, interactive as possible, okay? I know, Let's try to make it as interactive as possible. Ideally, you have read the papers very well and you know what the papers are about, etc. And again, I emphasize the word ideally because, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, come on, I can, I can laugh, I, mean, I can like kid myself and say that yes, you have done that, that you've read the papers, maybe you've read the abstract, and if I'm lucky, you read the introduction. How many of you did that? I'm not gonna tell you your advice, I'm not gonna, how many of you did that, don't tell me. Okay, at least we have one honest person who did that. Two, okay. So basically, we have, again, um, I think like usually we would have a short break in the middle because to give you a three hour pass, you stop listening later on. So let's try to do that. We have, this is what we will be covering today because you have three hours, okay? I'm just kidding. Okay? That's not gonna happen. Okay, another thing, I like to make that class a little bit fun so that we don't you don't fall asleep and I don't fall asleep. Okay, and this you have to comment this, I it's been a while to get this one, but it's important. <laughs> now, so what's the background? The background of this one is basically related to computer photography. By the way, I might skip my slides, I might go back and forth, etc. Did Miklos already discuss continuous auditing in this class? So what is continuous auditing? Who can tell me what continuous auditing is about the concept in general? So instead of doing these annual uh, samples and scores, right? Right. and you would look at it in kind of snapshot, you do it continuously where they take grades into the system and let the information flow continuously. Okay, so rather than doing that, on, uh, on a periodic basis, you actually do that um, a little bit more frequent, close to real time. Yeah. Okay, whoever participates gets chopped. Woo! And uh, what else is known about continuous audit? Come on, okay. Go ahead. Okay? 
This is the main idea behind continuous auditing. And by the way, continuous auditing or continuous control monitoring, or com basically they are anyway similar. What makes the difference is who owns that system. So is it owned by management? It would be monitoring. If it is owned by internal audit, uh, by an auditor, it would be continuous auditing. One of them is trying to identify, but like, it depends. The purpose uh, changes a little bit, but the concept is <coughs> practically the same. Okay? So this is. In general, I don't think that I'm going to be making a lot of money with uh, stand up comedy. Now, that was the idea behind the first paper that Miklos and Alan Harper started uh, when, they, when Miklos was still in, at the lab. Okay? He talked about this. Okay, so Alan, um, Alan cannot hear us well. I'm not sure what's happening, but I think he cannot hear me well. So which microphone? I think it says it's mute. No, uh, this is muted here, but not that one. This is the audio that's supposed to be. And by the way, Alain Soubier is from IDEA Casewell. Any one of you who's actually using IDEA, that's thanks to Alain, uh, who's also on the call. And by the way, the title, I the Exceptional exceptions. IDEA has also implemented it in the latest version of their software. So, version like uh, IDEA 11 has a component called exceptional exceptions. Many of you who were at the at W Cars, you saw the presentation that Anna and Kevin did. Okay. Do you want us to tell you if you have, we have an issue with the audio now? Yeah, I just talked to. Uh, <laughs> This is when Miklos was, at that point, Miklos was uh, at the lab and they had the CPAS project where they actually developed some, the first uh, continuous auditing system. Now, after that, we had several projects, kind of idea, me and my friends, our car lab, the car lab had several projects with Siemens, with uh, Procter & Gamble, with Itabu and Ivanko, with multiple entities. One of them is also like the late, one of the latest ones was with the internal audit department at Revit. Okay? Now, what happened? What do you expect would happen when something like that is implemented? In many cases, you end up having a large number of exceptions. Actually, the first project that happened with Siemens, the first time they turned on the system, first time they actually ran the system, they ended up with a lot of alerts. This is not because the system was too efficient, etc. Probably it was also because the system has never run before. So at that point, it was the first time it ran, so it identified everything that happened in the past. Okay? Now, this accumulation led to several problems. What do you think the auditors did when they find when they found this? They needed to check them one by one. Now they have thousands of them. Do you think that auditors have enough time to do that? What do you think? system or they shut down the system altogether. 
They ignore it and they go back to traditional sampling techniques. This is what usually happens. Why? Especially when you have larger data. The more data you have, the more information. When you have information overload, there are some behavioral implications to that. One of the things is you cannot identify any patterns. Okay? Think of it as this. Imagine each one of these is one exception that you have to deal with. You have to examine. You have limited amount of time. You have other tasks to do. How do you deal with that? You are really locked. You don't know what to do, what, how to deal with it. And the way it started, we were working on the way like the concept of this of exception exception happened. We were working on a project with a company. Well, we'll discuss this paper later on about control risk assessment. And before that, we also were doing something with duplicate payments. The first time I gave it to the, uh, I gave the auditors the results, I had like 866 suspicious duplicate candidates. They needed examination, and the auditors were like, are you crazy? We're not going to look at 866. We have other tasks to do, we have our daily job. We cannot, in addition to that, look at 866 transactions. It's simply not possible, give us better results. Now, what do they mean by better results? And I apologize if I walk walked away from my microphone, I forgot that I have to hold my microphone. So what does that mean? What do you think they would do? They might, John. They John. needed some kind of a relevant level or a group of the exceptions or at least some kind of information on what these exceptions are about and how some kind of stability, security or whatever kind of. They did not even want that. This is ideally, that's what they want, maybe they, this is what they were thinking of. What they really wanted, they said, give us better results. They simply meant a lower number. They wanted less than 50. Because less than 50, they can handle. 860, they cannot. Or 900, they cannot. So that's, that's just one of the things that would happen. And you talk about a multinational big company, a really big company. And yet, they could not handle it. So we started to think about it, okay, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a need to process, to process those exceptions that were, that were identified, okay? In another paper that we'll talk later on, we were working with a different company, and that was working on their control risk assessments, okay? The control risk assessments idea was that they, want, they had control risk assessments and control risk self-assessments. They had started, I think I can say that. This, is, this was with Prof. and Gap. Uh, they had, because they presented that to him, they had two systems. They had initiated that recently to see how management or business owners would, uh, would evaluate their own control. Okay? In addition to that, they had their own, their internal audit department. Uh, 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 risk assessment of the of management control. So they wanted to actually examine. And when we start, when we ran the first analysis to see which, well, basically try to identify some outliers, we found that a large number of the cases were actually outliers, and that doesn't make sense. So instead of thinking about it just as whether the auditor, auditor's judgment, was conforming to the predicted value, we wanted to see how far off, if they did not agree, how far off were they. So this is how we started thinking about ranking them. And we started working on the concept of exceptional exceptions. Okay? Again, this is to summarize it. There are several methods that we can actually identify that allow you to identify exceptions very efficiently, sometimes too efficiently, because you end up with too many items to, that you need to look at. And then, once you're looking at 100% of the population, with increasingly, with, with the data size becoming increasingly large, we're getting to big data closer and closer for, like for accounting purposes, this is expected to become a lot for humans to be involved in a direct so we need to have two things. We need to look at how the humans will be processing them, but they need some kind of a methodology to work through and to process those exceptions. Any questions?
machine learning mechanism, right? To do what? To predict them. To try and find certain criteria, right? So basically, let's say that it has certain scores based on the criteria of every email. So if you receive an email from a friend or a colleague whose last, uh, whose, whose domain name is the same as yours. Like if you receive an email from someone with at Rutgers.edu, okay? Your system will automatically give it a positive score. If you receive an email from someone trying to, or discussing drugs, your system will automatically give it a negative score. Now what if your colleague is sending you an email about drugs? How would it how the how would the system deal with that? It's complicated. <coughs> what? Because you would need to know the intent of uh, of the email, right? So you to, to 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 determine the intent and the validity of the content in there. Because you need to determine the intent and the validity, right? What else? Department. You also have, see, even math, 
was sleeping earned his chocolate stick. Now, what does that mean? Well, you have, we have an agriculture school. We have animals. So when they buy animal food, that makes sense. You have other departments that buy, buy like hazardous material. If you buy it in the business school, there's no need for Why would you buy it? So we had to actually adjust those to filter out those exceptions. Of course, they were flagged at the beginning. Okay? So we thought about the same concept of business rules having different weights. Weights, right? So different business rules. If you, if you violate a certain business rule, it might be different from violating a second rule. Not all of them are the same. When you purchase something, you know, like usually you have approval limits. You are authorized to make a payment up to $5,000. If it is more than $5,000, you have to get a second approval. I'm just giving an example. Or like uh, with your travel expense, right? With your reimbursements. The expense report, if it is longer than 60 days, it requires an additional approval, right? So it's not the first, it's the second. If for any, in any way you bypass that, usually this is less risky than somewhere, something where you have like segregation of duties and you actually are creating a user, like a vendor and making the payment to that vendor yourself. Because that vendor can be anyone. So there are different ways depending on the company itself. So those 
are things that depend on the experience, depend on the personal characteristics of the auditor, and depend also on whether you are considering it from an external audit or internal audit or et cetera, right? So let's start with this one. One thing that was actually interesting to us was that whenever you talk to any auditor, they tell you immediately that the segregation of duty are the riskiest thing and the most important thing. Based on the, like, when we tried to do that, we found that in a certain, most of the time it's actually excessive write-offs that came up first. And the reason we saw that, like we, this is our interpretation, is that excessive write-off is money going directly out of the door. So basically this is money that the company is not getting back. It has a direct financial impact. And this is why automatically their subcontract would do that. So, this is an example of how we actually thought about it. So we have like all these internal controls, different internal controls, and let's assume that those are records. The weights, I'll show you later on how we derive them using linear programming. And what happened was, so when you have a transaction, if it is, violating, if the transaction is violating this rule, and it will automatically get this score. So like the first one here, it violated this one, and this one, right? As a result, it got those two scores. It gets those two scores. And this will be done for all the exceptions. You can even do it for all the transactions. Let's say we have here six records. Assuming that you as auditor, you only have time to examine two of them. Which ones would you examine? Uh, 1002 and 1004. 1002 and 1004, right? You would start almost with the highest one. And the concept is very simple. This is more suspicious. So we're not saying that the others are not really exceptions. But the problem in many cases is that, okay, I have limited time. That's the matter of fact. In an ideal world, I would examine each and every one of them. In reality, that's not possible. You have limited time, you have limited budget, you have to stick to that. So if you have a thousand transactions, a thousand exceptions, you cannot examine all of them. Instead, what you can do is you can actually try to prioritize. So that was the concept behind it, okay? Now, this is different from the one in the picture, in the, in the paper, if you read the paper, which I'm assuming you did not, but let's say that you did. And simply because this one looks nicer, it's colored and has Sherlock Holmes in it. So, you guys are probably too young to know him. I remember like when I was teaching one of the classes, I said Sherlock Holmes. Now the classroom like understood what I was talking about. So I immediately switched to talking about Harry Potter. That they, well, that they knew. Well, and I had like 400 students in my class, so I had to make to relate to them. So I couldn't just talk about Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes. Now, the concept of this one is very simple. Okay? This thing boils down to this. So this is actually the formal one that academics like. Again, academics don't like the previous one because we're bored. But. Too pretty. What? Too, too pretty. Too pretty, yes. So it, that one is too pretty, so it's not acceptable. Let's stick to this one. So basically the idea here is that you have a rule-based system, okay, to identify internal controls, violations. So this is based on internal controls. So you want to identify all the violations of those internal controls. In general, you have some data that is, some rules that are derived from the data. Others would be from best practices, from domain experts, etc. So this is what they look for. They look if someone made a transaction uh, that uh, about the limit, right? Make it make a payment about their authorized limit. So they want to see that. All these things. So this is the first step. You have the rule-based system to identify the exceptions. That's straightforward. The second one is a parallel action with three. The second one is where you have, in our case, we 
had an expert panel. We wanted to identify the importance of every rule. Business rules are not equally important. So violating those business rules should not have equal weight, right? So this is how we thought about it. And we wanted to come up with weights, with a weight for every violation. And this, in our case here, we used an expert panel to derive those weights. Now, the exceptions are identified. You run the data through the rule based system. You identify the exceptions. And from that point, what you do is you have, you apply those weights. And then you have a, priorized, a prioritized list of exceptions. So you have a prioritized list of violations of all the internal forms. This is what you would be presenting to the auditors. Let's say you have 500 exceptions and you give them in, this, in that order. Depending on the budget and time that they have, they might look at 50, they might look at 100, and if they are really good, they might look at all the 500. But you leave it to the auditor to, de to decide how many they will be looking based on this prioritization. An important factor is always feedback because you always need the feedback to refine the model. Uh, in another study, this is the one that was with internal audit partners at Rutgers, we started off with like 28 analytics. We found that for, I think it was like for 18 of them, or actually it's like 17 of them, they had no violations, not ever. The reason was they had really good internal controls for those. So what we did at that point, you can, you can refine it and you can say that, okay, we don't need to include it in the system anymore. You can remove it from the system to make it kind of refined. And then later on, we had to add additional ones. Like you remember when, when I talked about the example about the animal food? We had to refine the data, uh, the rules, to update the rules to make it sure that if it is, if this product was purchased by the internal, uh, by the agriculture school, then it's okay. If it is purchased by the business school, it's not okay. Flag it. We had something similar also with a project where we had um, where we had um, a P card. It was a P card fraud. Okay, and the P card project we had something similar to that, where we identified people buying diapers. Like, why would the company buy diapers? Why do you think that company? while buying diapers. Some of them were actually fraudulent, but others were okay. Why? Come on, go ahead. Why do you think? Why would the company buy diapers? They have baby employees. No. Baby shower. Baby shower. It could be, but no. Sorry? Donations. That also could be, although that was not the case in, in this situation. Promotion. Sorry? Promotion. What? Promotion. What? So promotion. Promotion. That also could be another reason. The real reason, go ahead. For, for employees, for the women that work there. For their employees? Yeah. But let's say that they have a nursery. That's true. In reality, the reason ha was that happened was they themselves, they manufactured diapers, so they were buying diapers of their competitors for their R&D department. So for their research and development, they were buying those, and as a result, we had to introduce additional filters and additional rules to allow that specific department to make that, uh, to, to, uh, to allow them to buy, like if they bought any specific products. So these are things that, the feedback, this is why feedback is a very important thing. You refine it. Not only that, the data that comes from the new data that you are testing now, the new transactions, after you investigate those exceptions, this itself becomes an additional data to refine the model. Yes. You said that, that you considered removing some of the filters or some of the rules when you saw that over time. No exit, uh, no violations had happened in, yes. 
not in this paper, but in a different project. Yes. Um, I wouldn't do that. No, okay. Because that I personally would not do that because right. who can tell me that in the future exactly. no one would turn off that control? Yeah, okay. Uh, what happened was this was kind of uh, uh, the internal. Uh, this is a project where we had it between procurement, internal audit, which is usually, it's usually very weird to have both management and internal audit working on the same project and the same on the same um, continuous auditing and continuous control monitoring project and with us and what happened was that they wanted it to be a little bit more efficient at the beginning they had 660 tables we had no idea they had no data dictionaries no nothing so it was a mess and we wanted to make it as simplified as possible at the beginning to get it running so we tried to remove anything that was at that point considered as noise and uh, we said that in the future, we would actually turn them back on. Because it's easy, you don't really need to delete them. You just need to switch them off and on. So this is one of the advantages of doing that. Okay? <laughs> Any questions? Okay. So basically, this is what it boils down to. It boils down to you have the whole population. You identify the exceptions. You need to provide some kind of mechanism to be able to get to a number that you can deal with, that you can handle, a number that not necessarily, this is the number that the auditor would actually examine. But rather than, so some people what they do is they add additional rules to get everything else. You remember when I told you about the, the problem with the data, with the duplicate payments at the beginning when I sent them like 900, 899 transactions. So those, uh, uh, and, and if, uh, for, for one data set and for another it was like 860, they did not like that. So what they wanted us to do was to add from the beginning an additional filter that would simply filter out everything else. So we thought maybe it's not the best way because in this case we have lost some information. So maybe we have a lot of false negatives. So instead of doing that, let's give it, let's give the auditor, the human user, the choice to decide whether to go with one way or the other. And as a result, this is how we ended up doing that. We actually introduced all those filters to get them as, to get them as uh, uh, more or less a prioritized list. Okay? Again, the first step is to create a rule-based system. This was, in our case, in some, in some other cases, it doesn't have to be a rule-based system. It could be like neural networks identifying some exception. It doesn't matter. But in this case, it was a rule-based system. I personally prefer to use what we call explainable AI rather than using black box AI, simply because of the additional ethical implications of using black box AI and the negative sentiment sometimes that auditors and human users have towards black box AI because they don't understand it. And accountants in general, we are conservative. As a result, we are risk averse. And if we don't understand something, we usually tend not to use it. Just look at the reviews of papers. When, if you get a review and you don't understand the model, I'm not talking about you guys specifically, but in general, a lot of reviewers, what do they do? What do they do? Reject it. They reject the paper, right? They don't even look at it because they don't say that their ego is too big, so they don't say that I don't understand the paper. They say that, yeah, this is not, this is like total BS, and we reject it. That's because they didn't understand it and they take the safe, basically, they take the uh, safest way. When we started, and then we looked at it because it was interpretable, so those were based on the rules are based on the internal controls and the best uh, practices that were done. Okay, we used simulated data for that one. We, at that point, we did not have a real order to cash. The reason why we picked, why do you think we picked order to cash? Because this is one of the high risk areas, right? This is where you, people are paying money, the company is paying money. So they, this is a very high risk area that they want to co keep control over. Now, again, one of the things that we did not want to do, we had, we ended up with
with having 12 tests that we wanted to run, and we did not want to ask the users to rank them. You know, as humans, we're not good when you give, when someone gives you 10 items to rank, it's difficult. I can tell, give you two items, and if I tell you, okay, which one do you prefer, A or B? That's easy, you prefer to have, if I now tell you, you prefer to have, like sneakers, or all of them are sneakers, yeah, okay, three musketeers, which one would you pick? It's why they have different ones. Anyways, which one would you pick? That's easy, but if I give you like hundreds of them, you can rank maybe the first couple of them, but not the remaining ones. So instead, we decided to do it in a different way. We categorized them as into four categories. One of them was segregation of duty, unauthorized transaction, missing documents, and non-matching documents. Okay? And you'll see in a second why we did that. This is the list of the internal controls descriptions and what basically which category they would fall. Okay? At this point, I'm not gonna focus on these uh, today. We're not going to focus on the results of every paper because that's not the point of this class. The point is to introduce it to different methods, to different tasks, to different research, lines of research. Because this will change from one instance to the, from one uh, context to the other. Now, we had, like I said, we had 28 participants, okay? We wanted to have senior auditors. We applied to get more auditors from CAQ, from the Center of Audit Quality. We did not get that from many accounting firms, did not give us any participants. After begging a lot of people to fill out the survey, they actually did that. So we ended up having something like that. And every, for, so instead of doing that, instead of actually giving them two rules to, um, to actually uh, rank, we gave them transactions. And the rationale was this. When an auditor goes on an engagement, or if they are actually examining internal control, right, they are testing the control, no one will come and tell them that, okay, there was the violation of this internal control and a violation of the, in, this internal control. They will simply see transactions. They look at a transaction like that, and they will see that, okay, this one is missing some information. Why is it missing this information? Right? This is how, so we try to emulate real life. How would an auditor encounter, what kind of data they would encounter? And we saw that they would see this. And at the same time, in order for the auditor, in order for the, to see that the auditors really are testing the rules or the internal control that we have in mind, we ask them to provide a justification. So this is how it would look like. So this is basically, unfortunately it's not very clear, but this is, um, shipment document approved by, so it was approved by the same person who created it. This is a clear violation of segregation of duty. The second one has missing values. This is an orphan, orphan invoices. Now, there is no right or wrong answer. I might look at this one and say that, no, this is more important. Nicole might look at this one and say that, no, I, I think that segregation of duty is more important. Simply because of my own experience and her own experience. Maybe I have encountered fraud that was caused by something like this. As opposed to Nicole who would have had issues with segregation of duty. Okay? So this is what we asked them to do. We would give them something like this. survey had 17 pairs like that. We give them two transactions and we ask them to rank, to, to basically, not to rank, but to select the ones that presents the highest risk according to them. Sometimes there is an additional information that they might look at. So they would look at this one. What do you see? When you guys look at this one, what do you see? Do you see any issues with those transactions? And just to let you know, 16 of those pairs violated, each transaction would violate one internal control. The 17th one in violated two internal controls for different reasons. So what do you think?
platform, so this was a different price. Why is it a different price? Certainly, right? And it could be about paying my friend more or something like that. What else? This is a segregation of duty. Again, those are this is a different type when you have different problems. We have non-matching values for this one, and we have segregation of duty for the other one. Which one do you think is riskier? Now, one thing that we wanted to actually ask them after that, we would ask them, which one, basically ask them, uh, about the rationale. Basically, we ask them which category was the violation. Was it unauthorized matching or unauthorized transaction? Was it segregation of duty or etc.? Because we wanted to understand. Let's say that sometimes the auditors would get stuck on the number, on the amount, and they ignore everything else. So they say, okay, so this is more, this is riskier simply because it has a higher dollar amount. So we wanted to rule out that possibility. We wanted to make sure that the auditor, when they say that this is riskier, it's because it has non-matching values, not because of the dollar sign, not, not because of the dollar amount. Okay? We have basically, this is for the rule uh, inference, we have, like I said, 16 pairs, and we have more general rules, because like in the first one, it was for simplicity purposes, every transaction, but was allowed to violate one internal control. In reality, transactions might violate more than one internal control. Right? It might be missing some information and have and segregation of duty. I mean, if we're going to actually like commit fraud, okay, you should do it like well and scalable. one way or in another, 
<coughs> but not all of them were tested e at the same time. We couldn't do that simply because of the practicality of the survey. But, but would you agree that? That would have been a lot better. Yeah. Okay. Given you have time. Yeah. This is one of the. I mean, this is one of the things that I learned from working, like uh, about behavioral work, and Helen and Shanta, they can tell you a lot more than I do on behavioral work. You have to compromise certain things to make it possible. Sometimes you want to ask all these questions, but you end up with having no responses. I literally had to send special, like specific emails to like every person. I would tell them, like, please, Shania, respond to this email and please fill out that survey. Do it as a favor for me. And we had to ask multiple people, like really, like one person at a time, to get 28. And I had to jump through hoops to get some from accounting firms. A man of them, they would just like, I spoke to them, I spoke to their research teams, I spoke to a lot of people there, and they kind of simply said that, no, unfortunately, we cannot give you any participants. I was like, why? I mean, I'm not asking them to provide us with any data. I'm not asking them to provide us with any client information. All I'm asking them is provide us with their expertise for half an hour, and I couldn't get that. This is why we had to compromise. We had to limit the number of tests or the comparison that they would have to do. And uh, we had to come up with a different alternative uh, method to using like linear programming to uh, get the rankings and the weights. This is here, the difference is basically the two here, the difference here is that in this case, it only has one violation. Here, it is allowed to have multiple that's the difference between the two. Okay? We also tried to see, uh, to look for the agreement. So this part here, this is called the, the certainty measure. Uh, and this is like the certainty here, we wanted to see, okay, it's uh, based on the different auditors. Okay? If 50% said yes, 50% 50 said one, 50% said two, then you have a lot less certainty about that specific rule, that, that comparison. In, a, in comparison to, for example, when you have 95% of the respondents chose transaction one, then you have a lot, like a much higher certainty in this case. Any questions about this? The second part is where we identify, okay, we identify the transactions, and this is what we call a cumulative risk Okay, the cumulative risk score is basically the sum of all the violations multiplied by their weight of every violation. This variable here, this is a binary, it's one and zero. So if it violates rule number one, it gets a one, then it gets the weight of that one. If it did not violate rule number two, B becomes a zero, and as a result, the weight would be zero multiplied by the one. Any questions about this? Yes. Sorry, but what is the number of controls in the expert? We had 12. We had 30 something at the beginning and we had to limit it to 12 for practical purposes. So in this linear program, N is always 12? The previous linear program? 24. We did it as 24 again to make it easier for the calculations. I can show you how I ran it how we ran the linear programming uh, after class in Milan. I can show you exactly like the program that we had in SAS and how we actually replicated it also in Excel. We wanted to kind of double check. I can show you how it worked with the 12 and why we calculated it as 24. As you can see here, the sum should be two because we wanted to make sure that no weight would be kind of, because if you have a weight that is zero, you end up with having a weight that is zero, it means that this rule is out altogether. So basically they kind of rule it out, and this is not the option. We wanted to have all the rules, and this goes back to Jonas's point earlier, why, when we were working with internal audit department, why did we actually remove the additional rules that did not have any violation? You should keep them for the future to see if there was any future violation. And this is why we didn't want that system to be compromised. We didn't want to have in the future transactions that had a weight of zero. Because in this case, 
even if there was a violation of that rule, in the future it would get a zero. So we forced it to have at least a, at least a certain uh, weight that would not be uh, violated. And with linear programming, you have to include, to introduce the, the scaling factor and the M, uh, because if you don't do that, in many cases it will put all the weight, linear programming that works in sometimes in that way, it would reach the simplest solution where all the weight would be so, uh, allocated to one internal control and all the remaining ones would get zero or in this case like one. We wanted to avoid that, so we had to choose the S and the M kind of high enough to ensure that we don't reach that uh, solution. This is what they call sometimes like this is a big component map. Okay. This is the same example that we had earlier. <coughs> and again, here, we wanted to see how Uh, I create uh, 
a vendor, yeah. and you make the payment, and yeah. then we split the profits 50-50. Exactly. Uh, we did not have this access to data, and as a result, it was like, it would be very uh, hypothetical. Yeah. And, and if you remember, like, if, to put a background information here, to put that, for example, Hussein and Jonas are friends, then this is basically telling them directly that, no, this is not okay. We did something similar, uh, Tiffany Chu, she did when we were doing process mining, she actually did some kind of like uh, social networking as well, like looked at social network within employees to see who are the employees who work a lot together. It's normal if it is from, for example, between me and Barb, right? Because we do a lot of work. But if it was between me and uh, admin assistant, for example, for, and the department admin from the management department, why? I'm not an, account, I'm an accounting person. I'm not in management. Why would I have any transactions with them? That means there's something fishy or something. Especially, I mean, this is something that we did, but in a different, we had access to the uh, to uh, to the logs, to event logs, but we were able to do that. But that's actually a very valid point. I mean, collusion. It, yeah, collusion. It's typically happened that way, right? If I remember correctly, it was one of the original 33. Tests. Yeah. We had original 33 tests, but we had to narrow it down. Yeah. We had to actually cut down to the more, to the, and you know, actually we did not cut it down like on our own. We actually asked a smaller panel and like four people to rank it in, and uh, basically to select the rules that would they that do, they would think would be the most important one. So after out of 33, select the most important 15, and then we pick the ones that were agreed upon by all those four people. And this is why we ended up with 12 analytics. It's not an optimal, it's not a, like the perfect thing, but that was the practical thing to do in order to get any feedback. It was either that or forget about the experiment altogether. Um, so this is something that actually was interesting. Now, we also wanted to compare how would, how would they look at from internal versus external auditors, okay? We looked at the, uh, all of them. As you can see, in, in general, they are the first five or six, they were practically the same. But there were changes when you look at, when you look at, the, the weights are different. I'm talking about the ranks. But the weights are different between the two. Some of them are very close. But some of them, like for example, segregation of duties, as you can see, Internal auditors practically weigh more higher than internal auditors, which is normal because internal auditors would assume that there are other controls mitigating for that. Use what you have, other mitigating controls. And this is how we saw that. But um, for credit adjustments, they looked at it as more serious. Internal auditors looked at it as more serious. And so, okay, so this is just like a different organization. This is where we actually looked at how people were, this is how we calculated the agreement. I know it's kind of like difficult to see because of the font that's small, but basically we tried to see for the first pair, how many people selected the first one, how many people selected the second transaction, did people correctly identify the first one, like those who selected transaction one as riskier, did they identify it correctly? Those who selected two, did they identify it correctly? And then we calculated, at the end, we calculated the A. Remember AIJ? This is how we calculated it. So, basically this is how we actually got the paper. We, uh, this is how we got this panel and to kind of come up with, uh, to kind of come up with those weights. There are, like I said, there are different ways of doing that. Sometimes you can use, uh, you can, if you want, you can use either an expert panel, you can use uh, many functions. There are different ways of coming up with, and that depends on every problem, okay? So it depends on the problem at hand and what, what you're looking at. Like in this case, we're looking at ordered cash. If you're looking at uh, 
we're testing controls around order to catch. If you're looking at another cycle, it may be different. If you're looking at a different problem, like the paper that we'll discuss later on has nothing to do with that. It's actually about control risk assessment. And in this case, <coughs> we have to come up with a different way to calculate those, those risk, uh, the risk score. Do you have any questions? So did you compare uh, whether that risky activity is actually the fraud? Or In reality, you mean? Yeah. Oh, the, we, we didn't have the, any real data. That was simulated data. So we could not actually test it. So Usually, so uh, we have another paper that you will see it in, like the third paper today is about duplicate payment. This is a paper that I had with Andrea Rosario. And um, this one was actually done with, uh, with Washington County, with a county in Nevada. And we were working on it uh, to identify, they had a system where they would identify uh, exceptions, but they couldn't handle it. So at that point, they had one internal auditor in that department. In that one, we got some feedback, partial feedback. It was a limitation. Getting feedback is the hardest part. I mean, you will see that when you work with companies. Getting feedback from their auditors is the hardest part. In many cases, they would want to hide that information, which some, I mean, it, in a way it makes sense. It's not good, but it does make sense. So people catching? Sorry? People catching do not want to make, uh, do not want to sound wrong? Yeah, I mean, because, and think about it this way. If the internal audit department found the certain issues that, like you found, problems that they did not find, that means they didn't do their job correctly. So they will be blamed. In certain cases, they want to hide it. In the paper after this one, there were like three cases that were very suspicious, and we'll talk about it later on, but this is also something that was kind of um, an issue. With the third paper that we'll talk about today, we had slightly better feedback where we actually got, uh, and we have another paper that we did with IDT, with duplicate payments and we had actual feedback. So they did tell us that one of them was actually fraudulent, but uh, they wouldn't tell us which one it was. So, because uh, I was thinking, like, I, you know, I present some, my project before and it's similar to what you've done. So, uh, what, like, I'm, I want to do supervised methods uh, with the data, but do you think it's possible? Like, do you think is it gonna be available? It's difficult. You might have to, to be like partially do that. In, in the last paper that we did, like with Andrea, we had um, partially labeled data. So we had semi-labeled because from previous years, they had specifically, they had a couple of cases that were identified as du true duplicates. We used those to train the model. But the number was very, very small compared to the, the original data. We had to do it this way. So we use it. I know and we do it, but we say that we use it with a grain of salt. It's not 100% correct. The paper that we'll discuss after the break, actually the control risk assessment, we had feedback on each one of them. We had like nine, or like in total it was around 2,000, so we had feedback about each one of those transactions. That was actually very helpful for us because we were able to run logistic regression, which is a supervised uh, learning method. The third one, we could not do that. We had to use different methods. Jonas? Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, some of these methods will or is being implemented in a trainer, right? Yes. Um, I can I'm show it to you if you want. Yeah. I, I have that for you. But I mean. Thanks to Allah. <laughs> um, so, so that would be a great place to get feedback from them. From them? I'm actually working with Alain, not right now, because we're kind of up on certain things. Uh, I'm testing the, the, the new version with the data that they have, but so far, until you have a client who's willing to share their results with you, sure. you won't really have any real feedback. No, 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 uh, no. Unless you are involved in a project where they do that. Even internal audit department at Rutgers, we did that for them, we got some feedback, but we did not get 100% of that feedback. But we did get a lot of feedback on that one. Edward is working on that project. So we did have some feedback on that. Not complete. 
itself, it's not complete. Yeah, you call it. Um, so uh, we have another example which is a focus on the high ranking description, right? So uh, I wonder what is the, when we add up the low ranking description, the areas of the low ranking uh, areas, what is the sum of it is uh, very high, like it has a high rank. Which one? Uh, I mean, as, uh, this initial chart that said we should focus on the high ranking. The high, the high risk, yes. Yes. But what if we add up the low ranking description? This is why I said it depends on the cases. Like for example, uh, with a duplicate payment, the duplicate payment it's by default, like by the, by the, by definition, it's not one payment. So one of the criteria that we added was the size of the duplicate candidate set. So if you have five hundred dollars as opposed to fifty dollars, which one would you look at? The five hundred. But if the five hundred you only had two payments, suspicious. But the 50, you had 10 or you have like 20 transactions that were suspicious. In the, the, the data set, sometimes you have multiple ones. Which one would you look at? In this case, it's the combination of the information. This is why if you're looking only, only at the dollar amount, then this is a problem. But the risk score comes from multiple criteria. So for, for the duplicate payments, that's what we did. We actually have taken into consideration the frequency of the of the user, how many times a duplicate candidate shows up for that person. Uh, we also looked at how many transactions they might be duplicates. That, because I, again, in this case, what we wanted to see is it just like this one payment of five hundred, or is it let's say twenty payments of fifty? That's a thousand. So this is this is the combination of all that information would give you the risk score. I have another question that uh, did you consider the uh, to place different weight on uh, based on the uh, on the people's uh, working the long uh, the how long they work on this uh, error. For example, do you, uh, do you do you consider to put more weight on the choice of the people who work uh, like for five years? would want to have, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to have people who are senior auditors already or above, because to avoid having to deal with low experience. Uh, so, yeah, so all of them, they have experience in audit, but some of the participants that we got from accounting firm, they wouldn't even allow us to have an online survey. We had to actually, they actually sent us the, physic, the physical hard copies. They wouldn't do online. It had to be done Physically, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't understand why. It's the same thing, but they would not allow their auditors to fill the survey online. So we had to wait until they actually sent them a PDF form of the survey, and we had to re-enter the information in Qualtrics. Work with the paper, work with the paper is definitely very difficult. We have a lot of, it's hard to, to get the question of skills I don't, I personally, I don't understand the difference, but this is how it was. So at that point, we had very limited information, and they made sure that we, they had, they, um, they, they removed, they, they actually, like, even if you look at the statistics, we don't, I don't have the demographics of those people. So I have the demographics of the people who filled it on, up online, but they, the, that accounting firm refused that their employees would enter the information. They assured us that they had X amount of years of experience, but they wouldn't tell us per individual user. Well, actually, my husband worked for KPMG, so he did some kind of like survey by himself. And what hap what's happening is, so they do it for the training, the after the training. They usually do it after the training, like senior like audit training or something like that. So they ask audits, auditor to fill out the <laughs> the survey. So they do it like. Like after, like they took like eight hours of like training, training and then and they, then they did <laughs> this, this survey. So he said he never like like put so much effort on it because he's too tired. He's already like exhausted. So like I guess that's why they want the physical copy for Maybe. instead of that's like, actually I didn't know that. Yeah, they didn't but, tell me why. Yeah, but, but he said he usually do it after the training session. 
because that's the only time that the senior auditors can get together in the same room. Because usually they work by, by team, so they don't. That's like, why usually <laughs> online surveys are easier. But apparently, but, this is yeah. what I want them to do. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, what so I did not know that. Yeah. So. That's Thanks for the information. I didn't know <laughs> that. But that makes sense actually why they would want the physical copy. Yeah. Now it makes a little bit more sense that they want to do it right after the training, which sucks to me because like, <laughs> I, like I don't have. I mean, I have to re-enter the information, plus I lost all the demographics, so I could not say for a fact how many. If, I, I don't know if I have the, all the table here, which let me see. Of this one here. <coughs> okay, I included here only the one, all the questions that had this, but some of it were not here, simply because they didn't have, they didn't answer those questions which sucked in a way, but any questions? Yes. So um, how would you expect the rules? Like it's not painted the rule of its targets. So you do like you're going to uh the real thinking and then expand the rules for what what do you mean? Like if you are to implement this? Yes, but yes, so for example there is a case that This is one of the limitations of the paper, and I, I kind of this is something that you would learn in research. You always have limitations. So here, one of the limitations that I have to put is we only use the subset of the rules, and that's again it goes back to the practicality of survey or behavioral research. If you were to actually do it correctly, you would have a much more comprehensive set of internal control tests. You would have everything that the auditors would do. And then since that would, you would wait all of them. If let's say that, say um, KPMG wanted to dis decided that they want to use that methodology, they can implement it. Or let's say that if an internal audit department decided that they want to do that for their own, then they can do it because they have the authority, they have the time to do that. In my, and they have access to their own people, so they can test it with their own people. We don't have that. You will learn that, like with research, you always have certain limitations that, unfortunately, uh, kind of sometimes, uh, this is why you would have a reviewer sometimes will tell you that, no, I disagree with that, and as a result, they will reject your paper. But, or they would ask you, okay, you did, why didn't you ask this question? It's a one time shot. With surveys, you can only send it once. You cannot send it a second time because no one will put it a second time. They can. So KPMG, if they decided to rerun the, uh, the analysis, they can re uh, they can ask their employees, I want you to re do it again. But as researchers, we have to kind of, this is why also like when they run experiments and they always use students or MBA students and they consider them as CEOs. One right? Third. I mean, this is- One third, M third, yeah. Enter, right? Uh, but th doesn't this happen the whole time? And this is always, this is why they always tell you, okay, this assumption is not realistic. But they cannot really access CEOs. Unfortunately, that's how sometimes you have to compromise. And you can say that, okay, we take it with a grain of salt. So this is not exactly what a CEO would answer, but if, if the majority of them are thinking like that, so maybe it is, they extrapolate it, and they consider that this is, the real world would be the same way. But here, they have a panel of 28 people coming from different backgrounds. Ideally, you would want to have a lot more than this to be able to say that for a fact, that this is how they rule. Ideally, you would want to compare every pair or every two rules together. But that's not possible from a research perspective. Any questions? So Barbara is planning on getting it. Most likely she's going to get ordered directly to open. Al Pro? Al Pro. Okay. Definitely not the Al Pro. Okay, because the other one's 720. No, we're not getting that. Okay. Get well, thank you. Okay. Is there any questions? Okay, cool. Talk to you in the time. Of course. Once Email. you get them, I'll let you know. Email. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So I think getting guys now, it 
hear me? Is everything fine? I'm assuming yes. Okay. So this is the second paper that we will talk about today. This is about uh, this is a project where we had control risk assessments, and we were trying to we were trying to identify cases where the internal auditor judgment was not conformant to the majority of the auditors. So they were actually, they, the company was concerned about the quality. The uh, management was concerned about the quality of their control risk assessments. Okay? Control risk assessment is like a checklist of how their controls work and how they rate their own internal control. We know that this is a requirement, not only for management to do that, but for auditors to test it and to attest to the management uh, attestation of, like, or, or assessment, to evaluate the management assessment. They have recently started with this process that is called not control risk assessment, control risk self-assessment, which was done by the business owners themselves, okay? So they wanted to identify the quality of those control risk self-assessments done by the business owners. And at the same time, they wanted to examine how the auditors themselves were doing this kind of work, the control risk that they were doing. Okay? When we started with this project, we found that a large number of those cases did not really conform to the, uh, with, the with what was expected. So for example, you would have different, and you will see that in a second once we talk about the data. You would have different, we would have different uh, situations, different um, or similar situations where the final score was different. Like for example, you would have, uh, you identify three issues with internal controls, and one of them would be considered high risk, the other one low risk. And we wanted to actually find a way how to do that. So before we start moving forward to give you an idea of what the data is. The data for this one was what we call audit scores. So for each one of them, for each case that they had the score at low risk, high risk, or medium risk. How does this happen? How did they collect the data? Say that the, it is, let's talk about the internal auditors cases. The internal auditors would visit a certain location. They examine the controls for a specific process and the underlying sub-processes. So the, they identify the issues of those underlying processes and sub the underlying sub-processes per location. For example, they come to one Washington Park, okay? To this building, to this location, to the business school in Newark. They look at IT. And then they look at the sub-process. They identify the internal control issues associated with not just IT in general, but IT and their subcategories, such as IT security, etc., etc. Once they have, they identify every issue, they categorize that issue for every process and sub, for every sub-process at a specific location with either critical, major, or non-major issues. So the, the first categorization, they identify issues associated with internal control related to sub-processes at a specific location. They categorize them as critical, major, non-major. And then, based on the combined of information of all the issues for the underlying sub-processes, they would give IT, which is the process, business process at that location, an audit score. They call it an audit score. Basically, it's a risk score of low, medium, or high risk. So 
So basically what they were trying to say, they were saying that payroll at the business school in Newark is a low risk process. Based on the issues that they found with the, with the payroll sub processes. That's how they collect the data. It's important to understand how they collect the data because this is how we base the, pro the whole thing. Do you have any questions about how the data is collected? Now, what we have access to, we have the number of number of issues and their categorization. So we have, for example, for every sub process, so for this process, we have three major issues and one critical issue. We also have the associated overall risk score, which would be like, for example, high risk. We do not have any information on what the issues are actually. They would not give us that information. We try to see how, or based on what criteria, they categorize them as critical, major, or non-major, but they wouldn't give us that information. So we could not actually use it. We, this is why I put the line here, because this is where we were able to work. We didn't have this part. We have the numbers and the classification and the overall score. This goes back to the question about uh, supervised learning, because we had, for every, for every part, for every audit, for every process per location, we had the risk score and the underlying data. Okay? We had three fiscal years, 08, 09, 09, 10, and 10, 11. We had, as you can expect, we had more control risk self-assessment than control risk assessment. And the reason why we have that is normal, because as management, they can actually run the risk assessment more often than an auditor would visit that area. Sometimes we were told that sometimes it would take them like uh, every six months or so to visit to the same, to send an auditor to the same area, sometimes longer. So this is why they would have more here with control risk self-assessment. We replicated a lot of the work that we've done here for both, for the internal auditors and for the business owners. Any questions about the data? Okay. Because we had, because we had, labeled data, we were able to run supervised learning. We used ordered logistic regression. Now, who can tell me when is it suitable to use ordered logistic regression? When the value is relative, like like high, middle, low. It's yes. not absolute value, it's really to the value. So it's not continuous, it's basically discrete values. Oh, yeah. So when the values are discrete, with the re regression, you sometimes you use the data when it is continuous, right? Logistic regression, you need to have ordered data. It's not just that it is discrete, it's ordered. It is low risk, medium risk, or low medium, high, or critical, major, non-major. It We don't know. It, it doesn't mean that going from medium to high is the same distance as going from low to medium, or going from critical to major, and from major to non-major doesn't mean that it is the same distance. But we know the order, OK? Usually, this is, so this is a probabilistic approach, a cumulative probabilistic approach. There is also, so instead, so this is the logic, right? What's another way of doing that? So we actually had, and in the paper it's mentioned, we had a different way of using this. Instead of using logistic regression or logic, we could have used a different type. What do you think we could have used? Instead of a logic model, we could have used different models. Probability. 
Sorry? Probit. Probit, yes. Yes, probit. Basically, the other one is not commit. And the, here we just like use logistic regression, but we could have as easily used probit. Now, what we're trying to do here is we're trying what it does actually finds the values when you have the risks levels for low, medium, high, and then it looks at this is has to be below a certain value, it would be low. Medium risk would be between two values, and then the last one would be the high risk, okay? This is how we calculate it. When you want to calculate the predicted, the basically, what you're trying to do is saying this. What is the probability, the predicted probability, that this instance, this record, or this case, would be of high risk. Okay? So you're saying that, okay, let's, so you say that this is the probability that this would be high risk. This is the predicted probability that it would be a low risk or a medium risk. Okay? Now, again, this is a cumulative. <coughs> probabilistic approach, you calculate the high, the pro predicted probability that it would be a high risk case. And then the second one, it measures not just the medium, it measures everything, medium and high. So if you just use this formula here, it will give you medium plus high. Plus high. You subtract the predicted probability that it would be high. The remaining one, again, it's the easiest way is to just one minus the low and uh, minus medium and high. You have any questions about that? Have you guys already taken machine learning? Yes. What? We're going with the majority. 
So in this case, this is how we calculate. Those are the identified issues. Why do I not show you that? Okay, now we calculated this one based on the formulas from before. Which one is the highest? data sets would have to give to the world for internal auditors and for business owners. So we were either working all the time with internal auditors data or all the time with, with the business owners data. So in this case, all this would be coming from either the business owners or it would all of it would be from internal auditors. But the this is just an example. But the predicted model is based on auditors uh, no. opinion. No, no. Because the MC and MMC is by determined by internal auditor. No, no. Because with a control risk assessment, think about it like this. You have one team, which is internal auditors. That team will identify the issues and will identify the counts. So this information here would come from the same team, would come from internal auditors, okay? And the remaining information is calculated based on that information. So this would be the model for the internal auditor. Yes. Now, let's say that using a different color. Now, this is another team. The other team is business owners. They will have different numbers. The other team might have here like three and two. It doesn't mean exactly the same. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to compare business owners and auditors, because they are two different people, <coughs> two different like uh, characteristics. They have, they have two different characteristics. So do you see my point? In this case, the, the calculation would be, let's say here, like 0 0.7, 0 0.30, something like that. I'm just giving any numbers, and those are not numbers. But this is what, what it would be. In this case, we're only looking at one group. It doesn't matter at this point, like just as an example, it doesn't matter. You will see later on from the data that they have different uh, results, very significant different, significantly different results. Okay, now, originally, we stopped at that. We would flag this one as an exception because the predicted value and the assigned value are not the same. We ended up having a lot of these cases, and this is how we calculated it. So we now, now we decided that instead of doing that, we'll know, we know now that what, and again, at this point, I'm just going to say internal auditor. But the same thing applies for the business owners as well using a completely separate data set. The concept, again, when I'm talking about the concept itself, the concept is the same. So what we did here, we know that the auditor judgment was different from the consensus. In this case, this is different from this one. Right? So we thought about it. Instead of just saying that it is different, yes or no, 
We wanted to see not just that they were, it was different, we want to see how different it was. So let's see how different this is. We used two different ratios, two different measures. One of them was a ratio, and the second one was the difference between the predicted value and the assigned value. How do we calculate that? We look at the calculated probability for the predicted value. This is what the model would have mentioned. Right? We subtract from that what we calculated the probability that this case would be a medium risk. Or in this case, like the medium risk, it's the assigned class. So for example, with a ratio, we divide the assigned, the probability that this case would be in the assigned class divided by the probability it would be assigned, it would be in the predicted class. So just let's do the math here, let's just do the calculations. These will be the numbers. So the ratio is 0.645 and the difference is like 21. You will see in a second how we can use this. Now, let's see another record. This is also another real record. <coughs> As you can see here, there was one major issue, one non-major issue. Technically speaking, this is also an exception. Technically speaking, this is also an exception, right? This one and this one are different. But if you were the auditor, which one would you look at? <coughs> If you only had to look at one, you are just the first one. Why? That's correct, but why? Uh, Jonas is going to get out of here like very fast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would look at the uh, the number of exceptions. Uh, sorry, the, the number of issues. What was that? The, the, the major the issues? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this is another thing, but let's say that you don't have access to this, so you cannot see that. You would look at the ratio and the difference. So basically, what are we saying here? In the second case here, the difference is like 0 0.5, like it's a 0 0.05. This is like, which is to mean, you have 50%, practically we have here, it's like 50% saying that this case should be medium risk, and 50% are saying that it's low risk, or like I'd say it's like 52 or 53 and 47. But basically, it's like, Half the people would assign it a high risk, half the people would assign it a, a, like a low risk or a medium risk. What does it mean? It means that I might be too conservative, I might be upset because I had a fight with my boss, so I would be picky. I would assign it as a medium risk. Or simply, like I said, I would be, I would <coughs> be of much more skeptical nature, or much more conservative. As a result, I would assign it a medium risk. Someone else would be like a little bit more lenient, in a good mood, they would assign it a low risk. Or maybe because they, they saw something or they know the management and then, then something like that. So there might be another factor affecting this. But the difference is very close. Basically you're saying like it could go either way. You know it's like when you have outliers. You have cases where you know for a fact is an outlier. So you see if you have like points like this, Right? And then you have one point like that. You know for a fact that this is an outlier. Right? But if it was like here, then it's borderline. You, it can go either way. That's how we usually do it in machine learning. You have borderline items that are required more, uh, either like it can go either way. And this is how we thought about it here. So in this case, if you want to look at it like that, you would say that, sorry, you look at it and you see that this is the difference between the two. This is practically the same. So if you are the auditor and you only can look at one case only, you are better off looking at the one where the, the, uh, the disagreement is larger. 
you have a much larger disagreement, and that was the main idea. And we wanted to use two different measures rather than using just one of them uh, because kind of to combine the information. And actually, this is something that was interesting. We sent this information to the internal audit department of the company. We were working with them. And we replicated, again, we replicated for both. Originally, they were saying that it was too much. That's how we started to think about it. We gave them uh, uh, too many exceptions, but it was 25% of the data. This had happened like 25% of the time where the auditors would have a disagreement with a predicted value. That's a lot. You cannot have 25% disagreement. I mean, they are supposed to be experts, right? So that, there's something that doesn't make sense there. When we started doing that, it turned out to be that only the first 20 or 25 items were really suspicious. The remaining ones were mostly in the second category, where it could go either way. Do you have any questions about that? <coughs> um, I have a question. So can you explain why did you use two measures? Because it seems like it's the results from that measurement will be consistent always. <coughs> Not exactly, which was interesting, because one, and you would think so, but like usually the ratio is much more accurate than the difference, because it's relative. The ratio will give you a relative amount. Going from point 0.2 to point 0.4 is point 0.2, right? But this point 0.2 is also equal to 100%. So 0.2 over 0.4 will give you what? 50%. Point 0.6 to point 0.8, it is also point 0.2. I mean, it, it with probability, it's not gonna be the same. But we have cases where it would, it would have it split over the three of them, so it would be kind of like that. But if you have 30 to 60, that would also be 50%. So what we did was we actually wanted to make sure that when we are providing <coughs> the auditors, we would provide them with a combined result from the two different measures. <coughs> we wanted to try and be as accurate as possible. But which one if you are going to use only one measure? Think about it like as a robustness test. So but the main measure that we followed was the ratio because it is much more, it's a relative information that is given. Okay, and usually, the lower the ratio, the lower the ratio, basically you have the more suspicious the item is. It means it's further away. Yes. So in this case, isn't the first one is more suspicious? It is more suspicious. The first one is the more suspicious. But in the one. paper, it says later, later one is more suspicious. Maybe I read it wrong. <coughs> Maybe it's a good. Uh, I think there was more than one example in the paper. Uh, okay. I think so. Okay. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. But uh, in this case, maybe I'll show you later. Okay, but in this case, it's the first one. It has a much higher difference, and it has a lower ratio. So that it is automatically considered as more suspicious because it means the judgment is further away from the predicted value. Okay. With with time, I actually changed this one. For the for presentation because this <coughs> I don't think that I have a, a, the exact presentation in the paper like that because simply it was easier to present when I present it I can explain it if I put it like that in the paper it wouldn't be clear. So when we looked at that at that one we actually and this is looking at the auditors so this goes back to your question looking at the auditors we have two more we did it as a fitted model <coughs> where we would use it. On the, we actually ran it on very different tiers. Remember we had from 08 until, like from 2008 until 2011. So what we did was we actually tried different models. The fitted model is where you have the training data also used for testing. And then later on we tried the predictive model. The predictive model is where we use the data from, 8, 000, from 2008 to 2010 to train the data, and we tested it on 2010, 2011. One thing that was interesting, we always noticed that the highest 
percentage of this agreement takes place when the predicted value is high risk, but the assigned value is medium risk. We don't know the answer why, but we, what we were speculating, what do you think, why? Uh, it says in the paper that business people are more uh, conservative. conservative. Yes. So in a certain way, having or like classifying <coughs> an internal control as high risk will mean more work, will mean, it means like it's like getting an F or a D as opposed to getting going from <coughs> C to D as opposed to C to F. The difference is very big. One of them is failing. So the consequences of assigning that a high risk are much higher, right? As opposed to medium risk. Are you guys familiar with the with confusion matrix? You guys know it, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm not gonna explain what it is. But basically this is, we don't have accounting students <coughs> no. <laughs> Not the second year? Uh, second year? No. Interesting. Okay. So as you can see here, what we were really interested in, like the cases that were very interesting in general were the extreme outliers. Extreme outliers are the cases where you have, like here for example, the assigned the assigned value would be high, but the predicted is low, or, or when it's the other way around, the, the, um, or when it is assigned a low risk area, and all of a sudden you have it as high risk. We didn't have any extreme outliers in the fitted model. However, in the predictive model, we had three <laughs> cases that were actually assigned a high risk value, but they, the predicted class was a low risk class. Who can tell me why? Why, why do you think this happened? You read it in the papers also. Why do, what do you think, why? Why would there be three cases where the auditor assigned it a high risk value, but the predictive model predicted it as low risk? Why? What, what do you think? Bias in the. Sorry? Bias in the. In Bias, for example, against management. Maybe the auditor doesn't like the face of the manager, right? Or the people in charge. No, no, I'm serious, but this is a true thing. <coughs> Sometimes like, the auditor doesn't like a certain person and they would be really tough on them. That was not the case here. This is a possible solution, but that was not really the case. Oh, sorry. Wow, I hit the bottle. I'm sorry, sorry. Saved by the bottle. Saved by the bottle. I should have warned you, I'm sorry. So what, what else? What could be another issue? Maybe they found something that the, pro, the predictive model did not see, right? Which is possible, but that also means that they did not document their findings well, because the predictive model is supposed to catch everything that the people saw. So maybe they found certain issues with the controls, but the predictive model but they did not document it, and as a result, it was not there. In reality, what happened when we when we saw that when we showed that to the internal audit, the head of the internal audit department, he was very surprised. He was like, "Why? This should not be the case." They investigated that that case. Do you know what turned out to be? This turned out to be three fraud cases, and the fraud division of the department came over, and they came and they took over that those cases. As a result, they removed all information, <coughs> all the identified internal control issues, they removed it from the system. 
So if you look at this one here, you would have 0, 0, 0, but then the assigned class would be high. Why? Because apparently the original one had, maybe, I don't know, I'm just saying something here, maybe the original one was here 3 instead of 0. The fraud division, they removed this information from here, and they left just zeros. They just kept zeros, but they also left the high risk. Now, let's say that you are the internal audit, the head of the internal audit report. Wouldn't you want to see that this has happened? You still want to know, yes, you, you still, you don't want this thing to happen, but you still want to know if it happened. If there was any fraud, you still need to have some information. If you are the external audit department, if you are the external auditor, and you are actually examining what the company is saying, if you look at this one, you'd see that there were no issues. Then why was it assigned a high risk? This is something that you would want to see. And this is actually was one of the things that actually showed us it, it was much more, uh, it was much more, uh, it's, it was accurate and kind of like one of some of the assessments that we got as a feedback from them regarding the accuracy of the system. It's probably pretty smooth using blockchain internally. <laughs> that was before the blockchain. It was, I think it was in 20, 11 or 2012. But actually what, what happened was simply that they actually removed the information. They cleansed the data because they were considered, they considered this as confidential. And not just from us. It's not, I mean, one thing is to remove it from, before giving it to us. But they removed it from the internal auditor's system as well, which was the problem. We replicated the same thing. Now this is for business owners, okay? So this is for you. This is so that you would be happy. This is a completely different data set. And as you can see, the results are different. With the fitted model, with the fitted model, you can see that, wait, I'm gonna show you something. Well, the accuracy with the fitted model was 83%. As it is no, it's normal that the predictive model is always has lower accuracy because you're now you're testing with a new data. There are certain things that might change, okay? Whereas, whereas with the business owners, they actually improved with the predictive model. What does that mean? What, it, the, what happened was the first year the business owners started using this methodology to test for their controls was in 2008, which is to mean during this period, 2008, 2010, they were still learning how to do it. And then probably they compared notes with what the internal auditors later on gave them. Think about it this way, it's like an assignment where you make a mistake and then you get the correct answers from the professor and you learn from it. And once you get this feedback, the next time you have a test, you will do better. This is what happened here. They actually, this showed that they were learning with time, that they actually got a better predictive power than the fitted model, because they were learning over time. Once again, here we have more, we have more uh, extreme outliers. We did not examine all of them because, again, the traditional problem with feedback, but uh, many of them were actually probably the first year because they were like the first two years. As you can see here, it went down significantly. And although we have two, but it's like 0.09%, which is fine compared like to in the, past, in the previous one. Again, this is probably because in the past they didn't know how to, so how to do it correctly. With time, they improved. Okay? Any questions? So we talked about this one here. Um, we noticed that, again, the highest disagreement was always between high and 
medium, predicted high, assigned medium. And this is what we speculate that this is because of the, of the ramifications or of the implications that if uh, assigned a high risk, it's like a failure grade, like a failing grade. Any questions? This is the first time where we actually apply the concept of exceptional exceptions. And this is not directly like people would think about it as an exception per se, like, like usually people would think about it, a payment, an authorized payment, or uh, uh, a missing information, or something like that would be considered. In this case, the exception was a disagreement between the auditors or the business owner's judgment and the consensus. We were able to identify that, and when we gave it to the company, we gave it to the company, we tried to get them to give us the control issues. So that we would start from the start, you would have the identified controls, and then we would categorize them in a different way. They would not give us that one. Again, we have a problem with unbalanced data, which is always a situation when you have fraud or you have uh, if you're doing like bankruptcy, fraud, anything like that, because you expect the majority of the transactions to be normal, uh, and that you have the exceptions to be very, very few compared in comparison to the large data set. I mean, if you have a lot of exceptions, compared like, for example, the higher number of exceptions, that means you have more or significant issues than, than kind of looking at the risk score. It means that you have much more significant, like much worse problems. Any questions about this? Again, now, just to give you an idea about research in general, it's very rare that you would get a data that is completely labeled like that. We were lucky to get this data because it had the identified issues, the, the categories of the identified issues, and the risk score for every record. This is something that if you get the chance to get this kind of data, it would lead to very interesting research because you can actually use additional, so like so you can use supervised learning as opposed to traditional, like other ways where you have no idea whether this is fraud or not. This allows us to have a little bit better feedback from the data. And because we were working very closely with the internal audit department, we used to get much better feedback as well. Okay? Any questions? Now this is the last one. Again, see this one? I don't know how to stand up. This is fun. I know you're tired. So you have to laugh. Come on. <laughs> yes, this is better. Sorry, this is what happens when I talk too fast and long. This is a paper where we were approached by a county in Nevada, and they were asking us to design like, or to develop a methodology for them to apply exceptional exceptions. They have, that is a department, an internal audit department of, that consists of one audit, one person. She had to do the traditional auditing. She also had to look at those, the payments, duplicate payments, etc. They have a system there, they use IDEA, and then they were actually identifying exceptions, but in many cases, she wouldn't be able to handle or to examine all of those exceptions, and as a result, she would just do what she usually do, does. How do, how do you think she would usually examine the, like, uh, to look for duplicate payments? Jonas. Have all the payments, print them out, then go through them. Eyeballing. That's what she would do, eyeballing. She would actually look at all the payments and start scrolling to see if there was anything suspicious. And I was like, you really do that? <laughs> because, I mean, you have thousands of transactions. They have thousands of transactions. 
like 75,000 payment a year, divided by 12 months, that's like, talk about, like think about it, it's basically five to 6,000 per month. You're looking at five to 6,000 payment per month. Now, the reason why I was not really, really surprised was that we were working with a much, much bigger company, a multinational corporate, corporate and really big consumer products company. When we were dealing with their P-card data, the lady who was actually ha examining the P-card payments was eyeballing them. She would look at all the transactions and then identify which ones look suspicious and examine them. Have you, how many of you have ever tried to do something like that, to eyeball a lot of transactions? Not look, okay. How many of you try to scroll through a lot of information like that, just go there? We all did, right? And how many of you actually missed what they were looking for? It's only normal, because I mean, I cannot look at it fast like that. So I would assume, and then I would keep scrolling, okay, why, I know that somewhere here, why it cannot, I can't find it. Now imagine if you're dealing that with like 75,000 transactions. So this is how the project started. One of the things that I want to talk about with this paper is that we ran into some challenges. You know, in many cases, and Probably those of you who are working with RPA would notice that as well, that you would get some resistance from the users who actually do that. Do you know why? Why do you think? Someone else? Well, because you're, just, you're taking away their job. They are afraid that you would be taking away their job. The lady from that company who was doing the P cards was afraid that we would that we would design a system that would replace her. I don't know if they turned on the company file. I have no idea. As far as I know, it was actually to help her. She was actually, that, actually that was a very interesting project, separate from this one, but this is something that was interesting. When we were dealing with this, with this county here, the internal auditor, whenever we ask a question, like we would ask, why did you flag this transaction <coughs> as suspicious? Do you know what her answer would be? She can fill it. What? She can fill it. No. <laughs> she would she would respond to us, are you questioning my method? Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not. We're trying to understand how you work so that when you are designing a model to mimic your decision process, that we would do it correctly. She would get so upset, so offended every time we ask her a question like that. Like, why did you select this one? I mean, sometimes she would do things that did not make any sense to us. So we try to understand the rationale. She would get offended. And later on, she was also afraid that we would be, again, taking her job or part of or something like this. It would make her replace it. So this is actually what they wanted us to help because she had trouble. She had, she was one person who had to deal with all the internal audit tasks for that county. It's a lot of work for one person. As a result, we kind of came up with a methodology to identify duplicates and to rank them in order of suspicion. Okay? This is a good practice for you guys whenever you're writing a paper. Think about those three. I don't know if you came across those, like the Kinect three paragraphs. Did you hear about that? I think later on, I don't know if Helen or, or uh, Juan will be covering that. But basically, the idea is you need to think about why, what are you trying to do here? You need to explain why this is important. You also need to explain how you're doing that. You know like the, um, the Dean's summer grant pro uh, proposal, right? You saw those, right? Those, how, this is what they want you to see. What are you trying to do? So your hypothesis or research question or the problem at hand. Why are you trying to do that? That, would, that should clarify the motivation and the contribution, right? And the how, this is your methodology section. You all 
always need to think from those three perspectives. This is when you're writing the abstract, the introduction, or a proposal to show your advisor or any faculty or the dean's office or something. <coughs> any questions about this? Now, duplicates, duplicate records in general, when you think about duplicate records, this is when you have a duplicate page. It could be a duplicate vendor. It could be uh, tax information, like when you have sometimes how many of you have, like, for a certain area, you have, like, two different accounts in a certain website or something simply because you entered the wrong account and then it created another one? It happens sometimes, right? Now, this is something that is, if you talk to any company, that's a funny thing. They will tell you, no, no, we have a system that does not allow for duplicate payments. How many of you heard that? <coughs> but in reality, when you test the data, you often see that these exist. Some kind of duplicates. <clears throat> so for example, one Washington Park here. Sometimes people would write that it was one Washington Park Avenue. Sometimes Avenue is abbreviated. People, when they write their, no, their name, okay? When you write your name, it can be, it can sometimes be abbreviated. You can write, or you can use the short version. Instead of William, you write Bell. Right? Let's say that now I create an account and I use Eric as opposed to Hita, right? I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. But instead of doing that, now she has two different accounts. This is why in the US, for example, when they ask you to identify yourself, most of the time, what do they ask you for? What's your unique identifier? Social, Social security number. Because that's unique. There is no abbreviation there. So this is why it actually happens very often that these are, these are, uh, these are uh, duplicate records. Think about Rutgers University. When you go to AAA, you get the badge, right? What do you have as affiliation? Some of us have Rutgers University, Rutgers Business School, Rutgers University New Brunswick, Rutgers University Newark. Have you seen all these? Basically all relate to the same department, but it has different so in the system, that automatically means that there are duplicate universities. Now, you can do it when you're trying to identify duplicates. You can either do it as exact matching. This is where you're looking exactly the same thing. You're looking for a payment to the same ESA for the amount of $5,000 that was paid twice. In certain cases, it could be a misspell, or like H ESA paid $5,000. That would be fuzzy match. <coughs> okay? Now, this is the same concept. We have the same similar concept to what we have in, uh, with the exceptional exceptions. First part is we try to identify the exceptions that we are looking for. In this case, we're looking for duplicates. So we identify duplicates. Identifying duplicates based on rule-based system. We're testing 100% of the population, not eyeballing anything. We're testing for 100% of the population, trying to identify the candidates, the candidate sets. And then the second step is where we come up with a prioritization mechanism. Third step is where we investigate it and we get the feedback that would feed back into the initial step. Any question? This is the same as before. It's not that different. It's not that different. And this is practically the same example. Now, here, I 
I'm not going to go over this one. This is basically a comparison between different models that use the same thing. For this one, we're trying also to calculate the composite score. And this is basically the same as before, as uh, uh, or when we uh, the, when we looked at the risk score before. Uh, this is looking at the criteria and the weights of the criteria. This is a different situation here. Here we are identifying. Here we are identifying the situ the uh, the duplicate candidates, any potential cases that are duplicates, and then. We come up with additional criteria that would come up with the risk score. In the previous example, the previous paper, where we had a, uh, where we had the different uh, internal controls tests, this is different situation. This is why I said that the concept is the same, but the application or execution is different. So here, we have to look at some criteria. When would you consider a duplicate payment? risk in Europe. One of them is, of course, materiality, the amount, the dollar amount. But we didn't want the dollar amount to overwhelm everything else. So we had to kind of come up, we play around with the calculations. We looked at the frequency of the user. Let's say that Erica always has suspicious duplicate payments. That means there's something wrong. She's either, she sucks at her job, or she's trying to steal money from the counter, right? Let's say that I'm the vendor, and I often appear as having a duplicate payments. That means I'm trying to send multiple invoices to the county so that they would pay me multiple times. Do you think that usually these things work or no? In reality, they do. They actually do. So you remember a couple of years ago when we had, like, you guys don't remember, but a couple of years ago we had, we migrated the treasurers from a legacy system to Oracle Financial, an ERP system. During that time, we had a couple of months that were messy. <clears throat> and by messy, I mean people were not able to make any payments to suppliers and to vendors the point where suppliers and vendors were refusing to send some, anything to Rutgers. They said that pay us money first and then we will send you additional stuff. You owe us a lot of money. I'm serious, this happens. So when we had the project with the internal audit department, one of the things that they actually implemented, the, the, the university, they had a, an emergency system where they would allow much faster payments for suppliers to get stuff like that the university needs. Turns out to be that a lot of people, including the internal audit department themselves, overpaid. The internal auditors who are supposed to check for everything, they also made duplicate payments, simply because the system had no way of identifying something as payment or not. And this was something interesting. So these things happen. This is why we want to look at the frequency of the vendor and the user, and basically, whether they were payments off business hours. Like one of the things that we looked at, whether it was allowed to make a payment over the weekend. So at Rutgers, originally we assumed that this was not allowed. Apparently the policy does not prevent this from happening and in fact, during that crisis of the ERP migration, there were more people paying, like working over the weekend because they wanted to catch up on the previous payment. So that had to be adapted. But for that county, so this one here would not be valid for practice. And again, I'm telling you that because the criteria are company specific or entity specific. Basically, they depend on the policies that you have in place. For that county, they had no, like the paying over the business, like uh, off business hours was not allowed. Same thing with other things, like multiple invoices per week. Usually vendors or suppliers, they don't send two invoices in the same week, right? They combine multiple, if you 
buy multiple things. Even if you buy from Amazon, a couple of things, they will put them all in one order. So vendors, they also do the same thing when they send invoices. Another thing that we wanted to look at was um, when we were doing payments, we tried to exclude any payment above one week. So we did, actually let's go there. I'll be glad to do this one. Here, we used a two-way match. We used just the vendor name and the invoice amount. We excluded dates, origin. We wanted to look at things as much as possible. We wanted to have, to catch, because sometimes apparently they would make a payment two months later. And the thing is here, as you can see here, we had multiple years. So we had for 2012 and 2013. What the amount that we had were like 77,000 transactions and almost 100,000 transactions. Here, the minus 713 transactions because there were some transactions that were missing a lot of information, so we could not use them uh, for analysis. In this case, we did not have a labeled data, but we had partially labeled data. We had seven cases that were identified for 2012 as true duplicates. We used those, we used those as a benchmark to look and evaluate what we were able to capture. Basically, our model, how many of these was able to capture and how many of these, compared to the two other methods that were used, which is eyeballing, just looking at this data, or the traditional sampling technique. If you use the traditional sample technique of like 100 or 200, even 200, you, when we ran that, we did not catch any of these. So basically, if you were actually using a sa traditional sampling methods, you would not catch any of the true duplicates. In order to do that, you would need to take like 13%, even when we took 13% of this amount, that's a lot. 13% of this amount was only, with a random sample was only able to find one of these. Basically, you missed a lot. Well, as opposed to when we used our system, it would capture that. That's, that was the idea. This is an example, so these are the weights. These are, this is one of the limitations here. We had those weights were kind of derived when, when we discussed it with the internal auditors, basically the importance of those to them. And we acknowledge that this is a limitation of the paper. And which one is this? This is how we give, a, this is just an example of how we, we calculated this one. And then at the end you have this. <coughs> This goes back to the question I think Nicole asked earlier, if you have multiple smaller ones. Look at this one, okay? When you look at it, when you look at this one compared to this one, this one has a lot more. So, but the information was here between materiality was included, and you can see materiality here is higher than this. But you have additional items that led to a, to a different <coughs> score. Now, although this one here, so this one here had a, a rank higher. It had a higher risk score. This is higher than this one. Do you see my point here? We took that into consideration when we calculated the smaller chunks. We thought maybe like instead of paying, uh, making like the payment for like $5,000, make like 10 payments of $700 to be more. So this is the thing that we played around with. And again, this is just like a comparison of the data. We had like a lot of variables for this one. Many of them, we kind of tried them, we played around with them, but what they wanted to focus, because this is specific data, so the problem at hand here was duplicate payments. So we wanted to make sure that we have payments done to the same vendor for the same amount. We tried to ignore the date to make it a little bit fuzzier so that we would be able to identify things even if it happened several days away from each other. Any questions? And this is where we come 
combine, we, we can't kind of compare what we did to the remaining ones. We used 2012 as training data, which is kind of traditional, this is what you would do. You'd, ideally, if you have enough data, you would use a separate data for training, and a separate, like, and a, like one data for training and a completely separate data for testing purposes. And that's what we did here. And as you can see, we ended up with, with our approach, we ended up with a thousand duplicate candidates to provide you with, what we, with a reasonable assurance. That's 13.2 percent. When we use the same amount with traditional sampling, only one true positive was identified. But when we use the sample, which is actually what they traditionally they do, they actually use 200. If when when we use 200, we got zero. We didn't get anything from there. This is simply to show you that this was this turned out to be a little bit more like this one is more accurate than this one. Unfortunately, we do not have a final review because that lady got too sensitive and uh, she decided not to give us any feedback because we were questioning her judgment and her methods. I'm serious, that's what happened. So she stopped giving us any feedback and we had to make do with whatever we had already received, which is always a challenge when you're doing this kind of work because the user might just tell you, okay, I'm not gonna give you any more details then what can you do? There's nothing you can do. You either throw the whole thing away or you just come up with a different methodology. This is why we added this one. And eyeballing, trust me, eyeballing would take her a long, long time. She said that she used to do that for a whole day, every week, and just like scrolling things like it quickly, and probably she missed a lot of information, as opposed to running the whole thing. Any questions? So that actually summarizes the concept of exception or exception. You start off with the full population. You identify certain exceptions. In this case, it was duplicate payments, but it can be, like we said before, internal control violations, control risk assessments, uh, disagreements, and stuff like that. And then you rank them in order of suspicion so that, in this case, the auditor or the human user would be able to focus on the more suspicious cases. There's a whole bunch of research questions here that and limitations that we had summarized in the paper. You can take a look at them. Quick suggestion, whenever you're submitting a paper to a journal or to a conference, etc., the reviewers and the editors, they like to see this. Summarize it as a table or include several research questions. And the reason is they want to see that this is not a dead end research. They want to see that there is a continuity. There is, this is a line of research that might be coming later on. That for example, even if you don't do it, but I can come and I, like for example, let's say that this is my paper. And then later on, Kathy might just look at this one here and say that, okay, I, have, I can get feedback from auditors. Maybe I should do this part. Or I can do this, that one. Okay, so this is, these are things that you can look at and try to address. Plus, there's another advantage. When you have several research questions like that, people look at them. And when people look at them, they will cite your paper. Keep in mind that rankings depend a lot on citations. So if I write a paper, okay, if I write a paper that I'm should did, I have to, I hope that I didn't miss, turn out your name. But then in this case, what you do is, if I cite you, I have to cite your paper. And when I cite your paper, you, the ranking of your paper, of your AG index will go up. You gain more visibility. So this is always a good thing to do. The reviewers will be happier because they see that this is not the end of the road. Instead, you are actually, this is thought provoking, provoking uh, research. And this is something that they always appreciate. Again, this is my suggestion. This is just an advice to you guys whenever you do a research. If you are having trouble finding research ideas for your own courses, for papers, for your summer research, go to the papers that you're interested in. Let's say that you read the paper, you're interested in doing some research on text mining. 
look at some of the latest research in text mining, or if you're really interested in RPA or blockchain, look at some of the latest papers that were published in that area, and look at their research questions. They are giving you <coughs> research ideas that you can actually work on. Some of them can be easier than others. Some of them can be more difficult. When you're uh, reviewing those articles, you mean that they are basically to futuristic research as well? So the, the, uh, they don't want to see, they don't want to only see uh, limitations. Limitations, okay, it means that this is something that you did not do in the paper. But then what? They want to see that, and this, is, this was a comment from the reviewers that we got, it's not only for this paper, for multiple, for multiple papers, where they actually they prefer to see it as a table. That's my the way I see it. Because it's easier to look at here. Like any table as opposed to just paragraphs. But you can also have it as paragraphs. It doesn't have to be like that. However, they want to see what you suggest as future research to address those limitations. There is no paper, you cannot write a research paper that does not have limitations. No research papers are perfect. So you can always find this limitation. And think of this limitation as a what? Are, are we over time? Yes. <laughs> oh, 530, or do we stop or what? Uh, 520. Too, too, too many you guys are so, 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 so too polite. <laughs> so, so polite, and I'm so sorry. I, I know it's like this is finished. <laughs> this was like the last one of them. I just had a good question. Which one do you think it is? This is not finished. <laughs> So that was it. And this is something that I like because I can. Thank you so much.